Tonight's special guest speaker, Cynthia Barnett, is an award-winning environmental author and journalist who has reported on water and climate issues all around the world. Cynthia is a senior lecturer and environmental journalist in residence at the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications. She holds a bachelor's degree in journalism and a master's in American history with a specialization in environmental history. And she was a Knight Wallace Fellow at the University of Michigan where she studied freshwater science and American water history. Cynthia has written a number of books including Blue Revolution, Unmaking America's Water Crisis, Rain, A Natural and Cultural History, and Mirage, Florida and the Vanishing Water of the Eastern U.S. She's also written for National Geo, The New York Times, LA Times, Wall Street Journal, The Atlantic, Discover, and many, many more. Tonight, Cynthia will be telling us stories pulled from her most recent book, The Sound of the Sea, Seashells and the Fate of the Oceans, a book that was named one of the best science books of the year by NPR and one of the best nonfiction books of the year by the Tampa Bay Times. Folks, tonight's lecture is supported in part by a special grant from the Florida Humanities Council. This grant helps us bring in well-known speakers like Cynthia from out of town. As part of that grant program, attendees are asked to fill out a brief comment card. If you're here at the Blake Library, the comment cards are on the back table. You have two options. You can either fill it out before you leave and leave it behind. I'll mail it in for you. Or if you'd rather take it with you, you can fill it out at home, pop a stamp on it, and send it in the mail. That'll go back to Florida Humanities, and it'll let Cynthia know how she's doing with her lectures. For those of you watching on Zoom, I will send out an email tomorrow with a link to the same survey so you can fill it out and help support our grant-funded program. And with that, please, please, please help me welcome to the stage our final Coastal Lecture Series speaker of 2024, Cynthia Barnett. Hello, everyone, and thank you for that wonderful introduction, Dr. Judd. I love coming to Stewart, and I love speaking in this incredibly special part of Florida. Um, this place really represents the best of Florida and a place where people and institutions, including the Florida Oceanographic Society, have worked so hard to protect the coasts and all the life that depends on them. And just like raising children, it takes a village to protect um, the coastline and all the life that relies on it. And I noticed when I was sitting by the doors, um, so many people who came through the doors were people I recognized for their work on behalf of this state. So I just wanted to mention a couple of people who are here who I appreciate so much, and I know there are others, but um, my friend Kaylee, uh, Kelly Lehman, who's been working on environmental issues statewide um, for decades, is the person helping me sell books. I really appreciate her. Um, someone who's in the book is here. That's Carol Marshall. Where's Carol Marshall of the Broward Shell Club? Are other Shell Club members here from Southeast Florida? Okay, and um, Jackie Thurlow Lipich is here. She's done so much work on behalf of Florida. I had a feeling, had a feeling she might get some applause. And a really special person is in the audience. One of my former students, Katie Delk, is here. You heard that I teach environmental journalism at the University of Florida, and we're, we're part of that world, the journalists who work for your local paper, um, keeping you informed on these issues, are all part of that process, too. Katie is covering the releases and other environmental issues for TC Palm. And Katie, we really appreciate you. I love reading your stories from up in Gainesville. So thank you for being here. <laughs> so I thought I would start with the story of how I came to write a book of seashells. That's kind of crazy, right, for someone who specializes in water and climate. And the answer, uh, the answer is you heard, you heard about my previous books. 
I kind of think about my career as an author as following the hydrological cycle. I started with um, fresh water in Florida, and then I did a book about the global water crisis. I am Rain's biographer. After I did all of those things, I was kind of casting about how am I going to write about the ocean? I wanted to write about the ocean next. And I was visiting this lovely seashell museum on the southwest coast of Florida. Has anyone been to the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum? Very cool place if you get a chance to go to Sanibel. I happen to be visiting. Um, Sanibel, if you don't know, is an extremely shelly place. It's sort of famous, sort of famous for this wonderful animal uh, called the Junonia. You may know its shell. I particularly like the animal that builds that shell, the wonderful black and yellow uh, marine mollusk that builds it. Anyway, I, I was giving a talk at the Bailey Matthews National Shell Museum, and afterward, I went out to dinner with the director, and she told me an incredibly disturbing story. They had done a survey of visitors to find out how much their visitors already knew about seashells. And these visitors were mostly tourists visiting Florida with their children. And the survey revealed that 90% of the visitors to the museum didn't know that a shell was made by a living animal. Most people thought it was some sort of rock or stone. So um, after she told me that story, I tossed and turned in my bed that night. I just couldn't, I couldn't believe it. I thought that said so much about kind of the state of the world and the state of how we appreciate and know nature. And by the time I woke up the next morning, I knew that my next book would be about seashells. And that story, um, the way we know seashells kind of reminds me about the way we understand the ocean itself. Um, we've always loved seashells for their beautiful exterior. And of course, this is a queen conch. We've loved them for this beautiful exterior rather than the life inside, right? And there's the wonderful queen conch with her little eyes poking out. And, and similarly, I think we've loved the oceans that way, right? We love the oceans as this postcard or beautiful view rather than the very source of life. And so I just started thinking about what a perfect metaphor seashells are in that way. They're also, um, there are also, there are other kinds of metaphors too. As an environmental writer, I particularly love um, thinking about metaphors with nature, and I love the idea of listening. People always wanted to listen to seashells, right? So we've long held seashells to our ears to seek wisdom in their polished worlds, and what's remarkable is how often they actually answer with clear truths in murky times. So I'm going to tell you some of, the, some of those stories couple of examples. Extinct shelled creatures like the spiraling ammonoids gave fossilized proof of evolution in a, in a time when that was still a controversial idea. Seashells on mountaintops told a story of shifting continents and rising and falling seas, articulating an Earth history much older than the 6,000 years suggested by the Bible. These cockle shells with round holes in the top stashed in a Neanderthal cave along the Iberian coast of Spain were collected empty. Scientists know that they had been collected empty um, for reasons other than food. So they were collected for reasons that were fundamentally aesthetic. And finds like this helped scientists overturn two centuries of assumptions and poorly conceived science that Neanderthals were dim-witted 
brutes. Actually, it's known that they had a that they had a sense of beauty and a sense of culture. So I love how seashells are kind of fact checkers, right? Setting setting the record straight. Um, so several of you coming in said you had already started the book or read the book, and I really appreciate that. You know, um, if you've started the book, that I open with that Neanderthal shell cache, and I imagine that human hand 100,000 years ago collecting those shells. And um, I'm also in those opening pages remembering my own daughter collecting shells when she had small hands. Her hands are big college age hands now. <laughs> so I think there is something fundamentally pleasing about seashells to our brains. It has to do with their beauty, their patterns and flourishes, their textures and colors, but I think it also has to do with memory, starting with that long arc of human memory and how long humans have interacted with seashells and extending to our own memories of collecting shells. So I collected shells here in Southwest Florida with my grandmothers and now with my, with my daughter, and I think that's all sort of baked in and part of what gives us this profound love of shells. Seashells are the earliest known keepsakes tucked into graves. This small cone shell, Conus abreus, still holds its tint after 75,000 years interred. This stubby cone was unearthed from the grave of a four to six month old infant in a large rock shelter in South Africa known as Border Cave. It had been notched by hand, strung onto a pendant, and then worn for many years before it was ever placed in the grave with that Stone Age baby. And I just, I find it so poignant that some person 75,000 years ago felt that importance of putting that shell in the grave. Um, and, and now we know about it all of this time later. So seashells were also the earliest jewelry. They were jewelry before gems and they were money before coins. Um, part, of this book, part of this book that was some of my favorite um, reporting and one of my favorite chapters, um, and, and also kind of a profound chapter, is the story of the money cowrie. Um, the f cowrie shells were the first global money. So sometimes you hear, sometimes you hear the cryptocurrency guys claiming that crypto is the first global money. It's definitely not. Cowrie shells were traded all around the world for more than a thousand years. They were traded longer than any paper money or any coin in human history. And I could actually do a whole talk about cowrie shells. I wish I, cowrie money, I wish I had time to tell you the story, but I'll briefly say that I followed the journey of the cowrie shell money from the islands of the Maldives to the coast of West Africa and all around many places um, where they were where they were traded. And it turns out that cowries purchased an estimated third of the enslaved Africans who were forced to the Americas. So that, that story is a, just a very intense story. And it also um, added what I think is a very important meditation in this book, which is that we won't be able to fix our environmental problems without also writing some of the human injustices that are bound up in a lot of our environmental problems. So as I mentioned earlier, in both nature and the human story, I really began to think of seashells as the world's great fact checkers. Many of us were taught that Native Americans and Native Floridians 
lived in nomadic and unsettled tribes, but shell mounds, of course, say otherwise. They once rose in Florida like temples in the ancient world, such as the great cities of Shell, uh, built by the Calusa on the southwest coast more than 1,500 years before the Spanish arrived on, on Florida's shores. So some early scientists uh, considered those shell mounds the mere garbage heaps of nomadic people, but now they know that the shells contoured by long ago hands girded homes and sanctuaries and public buildings, um, and they were even part of ancient shell work factories. Um, shells also show us where major pre-Columbian cities existed on US, um, U.S. soil. So the mounds in Florida and the mounds in California and those all over the country really make clear that the new world was hardly new, much less settled by uh, bearded men on sailing ships. So in other words, Seashells were often more accurate recorders of human history than the humans who first wrote it down. So many of you know this shell factory on the, on the west coast of Florida. This is a place I used to love to go when I was a kid. I was born in Fort Myers, and I loved going to the shell factory. And now I can joke that before there was a shell factory in Fort Myers. There were shell work factories all over the region that is now Fort Myers. So um, these, these um, tools that you're looking at on the right are all made from the iron hard shell of the lightning whelk. And I'll show, you, I'll show you a lightning whelk a little later, a living lightning whelk a little later in the presentation. But these were Calusa tools, um, and the people also ate lightning whelk in large numbers. They hafted a wooden handle through the shell's crown to make a heavy hammer or a sharp axe. They sharpened the outer lip into cutting edges for hollowing out their huge canoes. Um, and they honed lightning whelks into spear points, pounders, perforators, fishing weights, uh, lightning whelk bowls. I recently got to see a beautiful lightning whelk necklace that had been crafted by an indigenous uh, person. So they're really, um, they really were incredibly important to native Floridians. Uh, perhaps the most fascinating part of the lightning whelk story is how far lightning whelks were traded to other parts of North America. Is anyone here from the St. Louis area? So you know what story I'm about to tell. Um, lightning whelks um, were traded all the way to Canada, but a really important part of this story. And to back up, to back up for one moment, um, I should tell you that the sound of the sea is organized around different seashells. So I'm, I'm talking to you about the lightning whelk now, but there are 12 chapters built around 12 very iconic seashells to human history. So the lightning whelk happens to me be my favorite shell. I know someone's going to ask me that later, so I'll get that out of the way. But there's a chapter on the money cowrie and a chapter on lightning whelks and giant clams and queen conchs and other important shells. But what was so amazing about the lightning whelk chapter um, was learning about their importance to um, what was really North America's first great city, and that was Cahokia. Cahokia rose across the Mississippi River from what is now St. Louis a thousand years ago. It was home to 20,000 to 30,000 people in its day, and it had huge temple mounds, only a few of which are still standing. Monk's Mound is still standing, um, you can see it here in the, this aerial. Its base is as large as the Great Pyramid of Egypt. 
So the people in Cahokia revered marine shells even though they were landlocked. And the number that archaeologists have found there is just astounding. And what, what was most astounding to me about Cahokia is that by far the most abundant shell in the mounds and the ruins of Cahokia are lightning whelks from Florida. And scientists know that they're from Florida um, because of the way they grow. They, they live all over the south from Florida to Texas, but the ones who are born here have just a slightly different angle to their shell architecture. So scientists know where those ancient shells came from, and they came from Florida. So you just imagine this amazing network of native people trading from Florida all the way up the Mississippi River. So jumping forward, um, shells throughout human history, you know, beyond those few stories I've already told you, shells tell us a lot about ourselves. They kind of reflect who we are in time. So jumping ahead, um, jumping ahead in, in human history, um, I'm going to jump ahead to kind of 16th, uh, 17th and 18th century Europe um, in a time of, you know, kings and queens and exploration is beginning to get underway from, from Europe. Um, you saw these incredible shell rooms and grottos. Um, no, no, no king would, um, would do without having a whole room devoted to seashells. And seashells were extraordinary, extraordinarily expensive. Um, I write about, some of you know the story of the tulip madness that happened um, in Holland the same thing happened with seashells, so that aristocrats in um, Holland and, and England and other European places were paying as much for one single seashell as a painting by Vermeer in his time. And so it was just, it was just this incredible time. And this is when the ships are first going out into um, the islands of the Pacific, and they would come back with these extraordinary shells. And at that time, when they would come back, people thought it was like a singular object. They didn't know that these were being made by animals who were quite plentiful at that time at the bottom of the sea. So they thought they were extremely rare, and that's why they became terribly expenses, expensive. But they also they also kind of revealed human excess at that time because it was a time of a lot of excess. And so, um, unfortunately, the shell grotto that existed at Versailles is no longer standing, but you can still see some of the shell rooms um, in, the, in the castles of Europe. So the following, the following century, jumping forward a little bit again, I'm going to tell you a quick story of how the Queen Conks that you may know from here in Florida and the Keys, I'll tell you a quick story of how they got their name. In the following century, shell madness that had um, hit Europe spread to middle-class Victorians. And that was also the era that saw the first signs that these animals, the queen conchs, were in trouble. I actually, when people talk about the queen conchs and how imperiled they are now, they kind of look at 20th century or talk about 20th century overfishing, but it actually goes back much farther than that to the demand for queen conchs in England in the 19th century. There were even some scientists saying back then, British scientists who were assigned to um, the Bahamas, they were saying even then that they were being overfished and there should be some kind of limit. But, but that was an age when no one would even imagine limits on anything, right? And this was particularly beloved by Queen Elizabeth. So um, before 
Before they became really popular with the queen, they were called pink conks. I'm sorry, did I say Queen Elizabeth? I meant Queen Victoria. I've been reading too much about the royals, <laughs> the royals gossip. Um, queen Victoria, from the time she was young, loved the pink conks, and um, she had her own cameo cutter on her royal court. And they would make cameos, like for occasions such as her wedding, they made a cameo for every guest. And they were all, many of them were made from the pink conch shells that were imported from the Bahamas. So this, this um, you know, the, the overfishing and kind of overharvesting of animals starts, starts a long time ago. So um, I'm going to tell you another, one of my favorite stories in the book also comes from that era, from the Victorian times. So it's in these times when the middle, the, the, the conchs and other really fancy tropical shells had kind of been the purview of uh, dilettantes and royalty, but now it starts to spread to the middle class in Victorian times in the 19th century. And I'm going to tell you about this guy. The guy on the left, his name was Marcus Samuel Sr., and he was a curio shop owner in the East End of London. And he would sell seashells um, to, they, there was some, there was a popular, popular hobbies going on that were called ladies work. And it's some of the, it's some of the hobbyists you see today with um, seashells. Women would make crafts like mirrors and all kinds of things for their home or they might want to have a shell on their mantle. And some people also bought shells for still life drawing, which was also very popular. So this guy, Marcus Samuel Sr., had a little shell shop in the east end of London. It was full of seashells from the tropics and also other weird curios. His claim to fame was that he got the idea to make these little shell-encrusted boxes and sell them to all the beach resorts around, around England. And the sweet thing about this story, of course, is that you still see these little shell boxes today, right? When you go into a shell shop, you still see these boxes. So he, he had the idea, sorry for that bouncing thing on my computer, I don't, I don't know what it is, and I don't want to take time to fix it, but maybe it'll stop. Um, so he got the idea that he would make these little shell-encrusted boxes. He manufactured them. Um, he eventually had 40 women working for him, uh, painstakingly gluing the teeny tiny shells onto the shell-encrusted boxes. And he sort of made his fortune from those boxes. And he did so well um, that his company grew and grew. And by the next generation, it had turned into a transportation company. And what began as Marcus Samuel's tiny shell shop became one of the, old, one of the largest oil companies in the world. <laughs> so, um, so Marcus Samuel's son, Marcus Samuel Jr., and this is, another, this is another story that I wish I could just tell you the whole story because it's incredible. Marcus Samuel's sons ended up kind of doing battle with John D. Rockefeller to find out whether... Um, shell oil or standard oil would be able to send the first um, send the first oil, trade the first fossil fuels basically to Asia. And the Samuel brothers won that battle. But anyway, they named they named their company after their father's love, which was shells. And the first tanker that ever, they, they developed the first oil tanker, which was named after a shell. It was called the Murex. They sent the first oil tanker through the Suez Canal to sell 
um, fuel to their father's former trading, seashell trading partners in Japan. It's really an amazing story. Um, Shell today still names its tankers after seashells. So this tanker on the right is transporting liquefied natural gas all around the world. It is named the Murex after the very first tanker. So um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tie up some of the threads in this story by telling you um, that symbol, everyone sees the symbol of the scallop shell, right? It is so recognizable. You heard I teach in a college of journalism and communications, um, and some of my colleagues study branding, and they have told me that um, there are only a few things, one being the Nike swoop and one being the shell scallop. It is so recognizable that you don't even need to say the name of the company. You know exactly who it is. And what I find poignant about that is the connection to that story I told you when I first started, which was, you know, there are people, many people don't even know that a seashell is made by a living animal. M many children don't know that a seashell is made by a living animal, but we can all recognize the corporate brands um, all over the world. So I'm going to quickly edit the shell oil scallop, and I'm going to show you an actual mother murex. Isn't that a cool? I don't know how well you can see it, but I love... Um, that is a murex sitting on her eggs, and um, some of the some of the gastropods, which are the single single valve um, animals, they just they're just extraordinary animals. Um, many of those gastropods are born in perfectly formed teeny tiny shells, and they come out of these little egg sacs. So, um, you know, my, my, one of my dreams would be for a world where we recognize and care about all animals and, and life as much as we do, or more than a corporate brand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump ahead now. I'm going to jump ahead kind of to our, to our times or, or many of our times. I think the kids in the audience might be surprised when they see my my childhood, this was literally my childhood seashell book. Um, so in my childhood, even the shell books revealed very little about the animals inside. They were all about the shells. And I hate to tell you this, but they even had very specific instructions about how to kill the animals inside. So by boiling or freezing or digging out their soft bodies with an ice pick, it's pretty macabre for a children's book, but it was just kind of how all shell books were. Do, you, do people agree with me? Do you remember this? That's just how shell books and shell identification guides were in the past. Um, but of course, oh yeah, boiling pots. A lot of you who have been, who grew up in Florida or have been coming here for many years or came here as kids, you'll remember we also had boiling pots down by the beach or boiling pots in, um, or little like hot, hot pots in hotel rooms by the beach so that when you collected the live animals, you could come back and boil them out and clean your shells and take your shells home. Um, one joke at the time had it that the best place to find seashells in Florida was at the Georgia border because that's when tourist car trunks started to stink and they would dump the shells on the side of the road. Now, this may seem like such an awful and macabre story to tell you, but the reason I like telling this story, and I appreciate this story, is to see this, the changing ethos over time, and to see that the generation of children coming up now do know 
about the animals that build the shells and have a real ethic for not collecting live animals. So these things, the environmental ethic changes over time. And it changes, it can change in a generation and you can see it changing. And that's very important to think about for the environmental problems that we face now. So anyway, as, as we know, um, these are animals that swim. I love how scallops swim and crawl and burrow down in the sand and flip somersaults and look at you with curious eyes. They're also just extraordinary architects that build their shells from minerals in the surrounding sea, primarily um, calcium carbonate, putting down layers of shell as they grow. Their reliance on those minerals makes them sentinels for what is happening to the oceans today. Um, can anyone tell me what this animal is, by the way? The, I hear, I hear the uh, member, of, the president of the Broward Shell Club got it right. This, <laughs> this is a money cowrie. And I just love, I love thinking about the lives and afterlives of shells. Here is this extraordinary animal um, living on the reef. It pushes up its, what's called its mantle up the side. Um, that mantle helps make a cowrie shell as glossy as it is. And just imagine that was money for more than a thousand years. If you have teenagers in your life, you know that people, they love to wear cowrie necklaces and cowrie anklets, and they're still, they're still a big part of the culture. And, you know, they're, they're these extraordinary reef animals um, that are building. They are, they are makers of jewelry. They are minters, and they are making these extraordinary shells. So back to the chemical changes that are happening in the ocean. The oceans have absorbed nearly a third of the extra carbon dioxide that humans have sent into the atmosphere since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, which has made them a third more acidic since that time. The oceans have also taken up more than 90% of the resulting heat from the heat trapping gases that are blanketing the earth. So these changes are often invisible to our human eyes, but seashells are really showing us what's happening to the oceans just in that same way they, they once revealed, you know, evolution and geologic change. Too much carbon dioxide in seawater causes chemical reactions that reduce the pH and the carbonate concentration, making it harder for these animals to build their shells. This phenomenon was first seen in sea butterflies or pteropods quite some time ago, more, more than 10 years ago, but now it is revealing itself in other mollusks including farm-raised shellfish that are so important to aquaculture. Um, some parts of the ocean are also becoming too warm for mollusks. I know um, someone who came in and was talking to me earlier um, said he had gotten to see the Great Barrier Reef, and it was great that he got to see it before so much as of the damage has been done by warming. Um, but at left is a giant clam um, dying on the Great Barrier Reef. Um, they're, they're pressured by bleaching and, and ocean warming. And this was a scene um, from the summer heat that killed... Um, Summer heat is now killing people, as we know, all over the world. It is killing, you know, millions and millions of mollusks, just mollusks that live in places that are warming and becoming too warm for them to survive. And like I said, scallops and aquaculture um, and 
eating, eating mollusks are a big part of that story. So this was a story, this was a story from the New York Times when the scallop, the, the baymen went out um, in November for scallops and found many of them dead. Um, a lot of the problems with both the wild scallop harvest and scallop aquaculture are now um, attributed to ocean warming. And, and that's such a, such a poignant story to think about the scallops dying when they have been such, a, such an important part of our own human cultural history from the sloop of Aphrodite to the story of St. James in the Bible. Um, so I want to, I want to transition now um, to, to the hopeful, the hopeful parts of the story and the, and the, and the hope spots in the ocean. Um, you, you heard me talk about being a teacher of environmental writing, and this is, this is a really important thing. Even as I report and write a lot about climate change and warming and many other threats to the oceans, I, when, I, when I write stories, I always work hard to balance the warning with the wonder, right? There still is extraordinary wonder in the ocean, and it's, an important, um, it's port, important to communicate, but it's also um, what, what draws us together um, to care about the ocean and to care about all life. So this, this particular scallop photo was taken by a friend of mine, the nature photographer John Moran. Um, it's, one of my, it's one of my favorite um, marine mollusk photos. So, you know, the simple fact is that nature does remain utterly wondrous. And as in this close-up of a bay scallop, um, it just reminds you that we remain capable of awe and there also remain healthy parts of the ocean that show us how things can be. And that is a crucial part of my stories, but also the story of the global ocean. So in the final chapters of this book, I really dig into how some of those things are happening by following scientists and some of the conservation efforts that are going on. So just another word about hope spots. I know you're dealing with a lot um, with the discharges here, as is the other side of coastal Florida. This, um, this scallop photograph, very healthy scallop, was taken in the big bend of Florida where some of the last largest seagrass meadows in North America are. So there are these really big areas of seagrass meadow in the northern Gulf of Mexico where the seagrass is not dying, where the manatees aren't starving, where the scallops have not been extirpated, where the scallops aren't dying, and so there, there are really some lessons there. Um, part of it is about conservation. Part of it is about um, the lack of industrial pollution going into the Gulf there. Uh, part of it is about the relative lack of development there compared with the rest of Florida. But there are hope spots like this all over the oceans. Um, that, that show us how things can still be if we come together um, to work on behalf of the ocean. So I'm just going to hit a few very fast um, last stories from the end of the book before we go to um, Q&A to introduce you to some of those scientists I feature and there are so many others who I would love to talk about. I don't have enough time to talk about them all. I think you're going to recognize one of them when I get to her. Um, but I traveled to Palau with the, the Yale biophysicist Allison Sweeney, who is working on biofuel technologies inspired by giant clams. I, I know that almost sounds hard to believe, but giant clams get their energy from microalgae and sunlight, and we must investigate such alternative fuels 
as we transition away from fossil fuels, just as society was transitioning from whale oil to fossil fuels in that earlier era I told you about when the Samuel Sons were sending that first oil tanker through the Suez Canal. This is the person some of you may recognize. Um, this is Megan Davis at FAU here in uh, Southeast Florida. Aquaculture is another crucial part of the solution. Uh, shellfish, aqua, some, some fish and shrimp aquaculture isn't particularly sustainable, but often shellfish aquifer is quite sustainable because you know, a lot of them are filter feeders. They're helping keep the water clean as they grow. Um, but Megan Davis specifically is working on queen conchs, and she has promising work underway in the Caribbean to start queen conch aquaculture farms on every island run by local fishers. Um, lastly, I tell stories of scientists who are searching with some amazing success, um, including the most potent pain medication known to science for human health cures in the venom of cone snails and other marine mollusks. So this is just amazing research. This is Mandy Holford, a biophysicist who is working on um, cancer, cancer cures um, by researching the venom, the toxic venom of, these are terabrids. She also works on cone snails. But there are all kinds of, there's a lot of research underway. Um, as you probably know, as you, if you've been to the lectures here before, on how marine animals can, can um, help derive pharmaceuticals that are targeting everything from cancer to Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So really, really exciting research going on there. So in the end, I really hope that my readers and all of you at this talk will come away with wonder, with awe, and with a renewed sense of the power of the oceans as the source of life and the solutions to sustain it, and not just the pretty outside. Thank you for having me. So I'm very happy to answer your questions. Well, I think we should take some Q&A here in the room. We also might have some questions from the online audience. Um, and I will then, after the q and I'll be sitting back at the book table, and I'm happy to talk further. Does anyone have any questions? Rain, do you have a question? Go for it. What's your question? Junonias are my favorite shells, so why are they so rare? Junonias? Oh, great question. Junonia is her favorite shell, so why are they so rare? And you remember the beautiful Junonia that you saw um, on the earlier slide from the Bailey Matthews Museum. Now, Carol Marshall from the Broward Shell Club might correct me on this, but I think the answer is that Junonia are not as rare as you think they are. Junonia live in deep water, and they like to get under rocks, and they're way, way out there. So what's rare is that a storm, it has to be a really big storm that kicks up a shell and sends it to shore. Um, but it, but it's, it could be that Junonia are alive and well and living way out there, and it's just rare to find a shell because they have to tumble so far in. Um, do you, Carol, did I get that right? All right. <laughs> any other, are there any questions from the Zoom audience? No. Yes, I see a question in the back. The scallop? The blue eyes. 
their eyes. There are more than 20, scallop shells have different numbers of eyes, but I believe the base scallop has 20-something eyes, and they have extraordinary lenses that are analogous to the Hubble telescope and their, and their ability to see around them. They're really extraordinary eyes, and they do, um, they do inspire um, ocular science. Yeah. Yes. So, so Cynthia, we'll take a question from our Zoom audience. How can we help to better preserve Florida's ecosystems in terms of protecting seashells? That is, I think that is the great question facing our time. That is the question I think about all the time. And, 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 and the thing I think everyone in this room is thinking about. And the very, the most basic answer I can give you is that this has got to be a changing ethos in just the same way that in just one generation, we no longer collected live shells and now we just collect empty shells on the seashore. That ethic is how we want to treat our world, right? And these ethics can and do change. If you know about um, the extraordinary pollution in Florida um, 50 years ago, before we passed the Clean Water Act, there was no clean bay in Florida. Seagrass was dead all over Florida. There was, you know, a national crisis of water pollution that was so bad that rivers were catching fire in the industrial Northeast. This is not a matter of just one thing changing, one policy changing. This is a matter of the whole country at that time really said, this is not okay. We are not willing to live with these levels of pollution. And it was like a changing ethic where people really wanted this change and they um, inspired, voted for, um, elected officials who were willing to pass the Clean Water Act. They demanded it of their elected officials. And that was a turning point. It was a real turning point in history on both water pollution and animal extinctions. And we are at that turning point again. So it takes all of us, remember I mentioned all the different kinds of people in the room who are working on this, from the Florida Oceanographic Society to my former student, to people who have been willing to serve as elected officials, to people who are in a local club. All of those things are hugely important. We are all part of this solution, and we're all good at something. Like, it doesn't have to be one particular answer. Everyone here is good at your thing that you're good at, and you could use that on behalf of the Earth and its life. Yes? We'll, we'll go to another Zoom audience member question. When we buy shells, how do we know that the shells were harvested sustainably? Ooh, that's a very good question. If you are at a random sell, shell shop, I suspect those shells might not have been harvested sustainably. So if it was harvested sustainably, that is if it was collected from a beach without a living animal in it, they will be proud of that and they will have some, um, they will have some sign in their, sh in their shop that says this was harvested sustainably or where it came from. Um, but I write about this in The Sound of the Sea um, a lot of shell shops are importing seashells from um, the, what's known as the Coral Triangle in the Pacific, where the, shell, the, the marine mollusks are over-harvested, and they're over-harvested live um, for their shells. So it's, it's really hard unless you see it. I wouldn't buy them. Uh, Carol. So Carol is saying many of the shells in the Coral Sea are eaten. Um, they are food and they are a byproduct. So I think, I think many of them are eaten for food, but I know that many of them are 
captured for their shell, like the, like the chambered nautilus and, and many, many other shells. And you, you'll find that I write about this in the, in the shell book if you're interested in more. Is there another person on Zoom? There, there is. So okay. we're looking at a scallop with lots and lots of eyes. Somebody wonders, how many eyes does a queen conch have, and do their eyes have any special purposes? The queen conch has two lovely eyes mounted on the tip of tentacles. And I think the purposes are general eye purposes. <laughs> How's that for a scientific answer? Yes. I think, I think that's a really good question. I will tell you that I have met um, people who do those sort of programs who say they meet children all the time in Florida who have never even seen the ocean. And these might be from um, over here. It might be from the western part of a, of a county. It might be... Um, poorer families who can't get to the ocean. So I think you're asking a very important question. And the answer is yes, there are many, many organizations that work on bringing marine science to children and trying to create those opportunities. Um, as you know, Florida teachers are under an extraordinary amount of stress and pressure and, you know, are obligated to teach certain things um, in, the, in the science curriculum. So I think it's really important to support organizations like the Florida Oceanographic Society and many other organizations that get into the schools or create programs that bring children to the sea for spring break, summer camps, and, and things like that. It's, it's a really important point, and I appreciate you bringing it up. And, and for the sake of our audience at home, the, the last question was just, oh. generally speaking, uh, what are schools doing in Florida to try to emphasize the importance of the topics that we covered in tonight's presentation? And I, I do want to go to another question from Zoom. Is there any significance in the 1485 painting, The Birth of Venus, the artist Botticelli located Venus in a giant scallop shell. Yeah, so, I mean, there is so much significance to Botticelli's Aphrodite um, or Venus, um, sort of the same goddess at different times. The, the easiest way to answer that is that the scallop shell always, even they know even back in Paleolithic times, scallops were symbols of fertility um, and harvest. And like they would, um, I read, I read some, some, um, a paper about how there were particular, there were, there were scallops used in harvest cer ceremonies. Um, and so scallops were always associated with um, kind of fecundity, fertility, and that is how, you know, things evolved to um, Venus or Aphrodite, Aphrodite rising from the scallop shell. There's a lot more to it, and there's a lot about kind of sex in seashells, but I'll let you read that in the book. <laughs> Plus, there's a couple of kids in the audience, so we'll wait till they're a little bit older. So, folks here at the Blake, I, I hate to do this, but I think we only have time for one or two more questions. I want to leave a few minutes to wrap up our book sale as well. So, oh, yeah. are Thanks. there one or two more questions from yes. the Blake? Yes. After a hurricane, it's great shelling. Fantastic. Get out there after the next, if they let you back on the beach.
<laughs> if the beach is still there, I hate to say it, um, go shelling. Yeah, I think that's a good place to end. Oh, Kelly, did you have another? Did you have a question? Let me see if I can if I can restate that question. Um, Kelly is asking if I could describe um, kind of the the groundwater pressure, and this is a very weird part of Florida's history and Florida's water story. Florida is a place that is dealing with too much or not enough, and there's like no in between. When the settlers came. Um, the problem was too much water, and so they got rid of water and got rid of water and got rid of water, and guess what? They got rid of too much and drained all these wetlands, and that's part of why we have so many of the problems we have today. So Kelly was asking about deep well injection and desalinization and other technologies, but I think the real answer to all of this is more that we live more ethically with the water we have rather than constantly looking to the latest technical solution. Um, we could actually do a lot more by restoring the wetlands that have been drained and taking care of the rivers that remain and restoring rivers and all of those things. So um, that's, that's how I would answer that. I'll say one more thing. My new book in the, wor in the works is a global story of groundwater. Um, the working title is The Sea Beneath Us in honor of Rachel Carson's The Sea Around Us. So I hope you'll invite me back to talk about that one. Thank we absolutely you. will. And I, I apologize that we haven't been able to reach all of our Zoom audience questions. And I think we may still have a few here at the Blake, but we do need to wrap up. Please help me give a big, big thank you for Cynthia. And more importantly, I, I want you to keep clapping for each other. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. Now, before we rush out, I do have just a couple of quick reminders. First and foremost, please grab a comment card on your way out tonight. Make sure that we give Cynthia some feedback through the grant program. That way we can continue to use that grant support to bring speakers into our community. I also want to remind you to go back and watch the lectures that you missed. We have great high definition videos for you to check out at home. Just pretend you're watching live. We have that email newsletter. Florida Oceanographic Society is so much more than the Coastal Lecture Series. Some of you only know of us through these Tuesday night programs. Please sign up for our email newsletter on the way out tonight. Please sign up for that advocacy newsletter. And then I have one last update. We don't hire very often. Our organization has a very stable team of employees, but right this minute, there are multiple employment opportunities within Florida Oceanographic Society, including paid college internships, part-time positions, and full-time positions. So if anybody here at the Blake or at home knows of somebody who might be interested in a marine science career working at a local nonprofit, please have them visit our employment website. Folks, thank you for another wonderful series this year, and I'll see you again hopefully sooner than next January. But if not, I'll see you in January. Good night, everyone. Thank you.